here we are, episode number 12. Look out, folks, it's coming at you. Mr. Rubio used to run the Running Warehouse podcast. We have special guests. Who do we have, Connor? I mean, Joe, last episode we were talk- talking up Carlio, and we made it happen. Today we got Tom Carlio, VP of North America Running, and, of course, the fan favorite, Danny Orr. You might have seen him on some past YouTube videos. We love him. He always brings the big shoe details that we all want to know. Exactly. And recently we received this, <laughs> the Rebel 4, and that is this man's shoe right here. I know you have a team behind you. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. The Rebel 4, what, launched about a week ago, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's been, it's been awesome. It's been so fun to just watch what the last few weeks have been like in oh, terms of consumers that have been, yeah, we did that too on purpose, Joe. Yes, we tried to exactly. make him look as close as we could so we could confuse him. Confuse you. me, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but the, the last few weeks have been awesome. You know, the shoes hit the market. We've seen so much good wear testing feedback. We've seen so much good consumer feedback over the last three or four weeks on the shoe and it's landed and it's blown everybody away in terms of, you know, just its general popularity and, and how excited runners are about it. Yeah, I mean, it's a fantastic shoe, especially at the price. You know, if and I, th- I think like there's a lot we need to go into the shoes, yeah. but I think before we dive into oh, yeah, this, yeah. maybe we go a little bit back to the early days. Right. Uh, we'll go with Tom. I mean, how'd you give us a background? Now, you ran in high school. Yes. I mean, I, we're going uh, way back. I started running my junior year in high school, just outside of Boston at Newton North High School. I was um, sort of pulled into running um, by a high school coach, a guy named Mark Leck, who... I um, can honestly say I wouldn't be here today without Mark Leck. He he not only got me into the, um, into the team and running cross country and indoor and outdoor track, but he actually made me believe I could be decent at it. And um, and he went on, he went on to have a great career as a coach at Northeastern University and University of Maine. He's now retired, but without Mark pulling me kind of out of gym classes, I I definitely wouldn't be in this industry today. Cool. And then you went to college. I, I went to college for quite a while. Um, I, I, <laughs> I, I started, I, I ran track at UMass Amherst for a couple of years and um, had some success there. Um, the success was not um, related to my relationship with the coach. Um, so we, we had a bit of a falling out. And after a couple of years, I, I left, came back to Boston. And then another person that was really important in my life named Jack McDonald was the coach at Boston College. And he talked me into... Um, taking classes, getting my academics to an acceptable level, which I'm not sure today would be considered an acceptable <laughs> level, but I was still able to run for one year at Boston College. I had some success there. Um, and then coming out of that experience, um, I was lucky enough that um, Nike was expanding their club system around the country. And a really a famous, um, pretty incredible man named Bob Seventy, who coached at Athletic West and Joan Benoit and many other famous people he came and put a club system together in Boston that I was lucky enough to be part of and was able to have some running success, um, went to U.S. championships and Olympic trials in the 1500 at, more importantly, just made unbelievable friendships, um, friendships for life. We have um, a gentleman named Mark Coogan, who you guys have to have on the podcast some, at some point, <laughs> but Mark Coogan and, um, and I were on the same Nike club together and we stayed fast friends and it was fun for me to be able to be part of bringing him to New Balance about 10 years ago now. And he's had absolutely incredible success coaching um, our team, New Balance athletes. So yeah, all those connections from the early days still exist today. And, um, and I have to thank those people that helped me get there. Yeah. So how did you get into actually working in the shoe industry? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, while I was running for the Nike Boston Club in the late 80s, I think it was uh, like April of 1988. I almost said 1888. That would have been, uh, <laughs> that would have been something. But um, 19, I, I was um, asked to work or I got an opportunity to work at one of the original Nike-owned stores in Wellesley Hills, Mass. And it's interesting that people that I worked with in this little like 1,200 square foot store, almost all of them are still in the industry doing something across the board. My good friend who hired me as the CEO of Bauer Hockey today and has had a long career there. And then multiple people came through um, working in that store over the years. So again, an amazing place to make connections. But as my running plateaued, my interest in the running business had kind of heightened to the level that I really um, was really interested in learning more about it and have an op- had an opportunity to become the tech rep or the Eakin as they call them in Boston. Um, 
And I got way, 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 way into shoes. I got I obsessed. Even prior to that, I used to take my spikes and alter them myself and cut things out of the spikes to make them feel better. Um, I, I fell in love with some of the original Nike spikes and I didn't like the updates. So I was always running in the old spikes and altering them uh, the best I could and got to know the product team out in Beaverton at the time and um, had an opportunity to move to Beaverton in 1992 to work in the promotion side. I managed running events. And then, yeah, one thing led to another. I ended up um, in product Worked on some really cool, like high profile projects, including the 96 Olympic track spike um, program and the, the inline lineup that lined up with that. Um, and it was super cool, high profile, got to work on like Michael Johnson's spikes and things like that, that, you know, you'll remember the rest of your life. Um, during that time, I also worked on the Japanese racing flats, um, which kind of opened the door for me to ultimately move to Tokyo and spent about two and a half years living in Tokyo, um, really straight from the Atlanta Olympics, moved with Nike over there and um, had my first son, was born in Tokyo, and um, and then um, came back to Beaverton and, um, yeah, worked a few different things and ended up um, doing marketing for North America, running, got to work on the team that created sort of the original uh, Border Clash, which led to some really fun things in running, um, NBX and all those things that came out of it. So. Um, but I think my shelf life was was um, was starting to show itself, and I had an opportunity to move back to Boston and work for Saucony for about four years, and it was really fun. We just speaking this morning about it; just a lot of fun um, to see how much we got done in a really short period of time there, and um, got a great team together, just people that I'm friends with for life, and we were able to. Um, put together some really cool running shoes. They are inclusive of some great high school cross country shoes and things that they hadn't done in quite a while. So a lot of fun. And probably the highlight for me of the career is in a, uh, 2008, um, had a chance to come to New Balance. And it's been nothing but fun being on great teams, working on great stuff and having a, having a lot of fun up till still today. Awesome. Sweet. I mean, it sounds like there was a lot of twists and turns along the way. And were, were there any mistakes that you made or do you feel like each kind of change in path kind of made you who you are today and, you know, helped with your success? No, I think in terms of career, I, first of all, I've made enough mistakes to fill up a whole podcast. So, but, um, <laughs> but in terms of like career type, um, ca career type things, no, I think every, everything that some might look at as mistakes or opportunities to kind of learn, even, even if it's learning that you're not that interested in, in a certain area. Um, I did, I think, about a year and a half at Nike managing the uh, footwear for cross training, and um, it was it was more challenging because there wasn't an, a market as interested internally or externally, um, you know, for, for the product. So you had to just try to make great stuff, and it made me realize how lucky we are to work in running because the opportunity, the channels that are open for you, the size of the marketplace, the constant need for change in the marketplace is a lot more exciting than working on cross-training shoes, which really are not even necessary. So, um, yeah, so I look at that as a great, a great learning experience. Yeah. And you talk about moving to Japan, but when I talked with Elliot Heath, who currently works for Nike, he talked a lot about his time over in Kenya. Did, did you spend any time in Kenya working with uh, the athletes? I did some Kenya trips and uh, <laughs> they were awesome. This was right at the time that um, Nike and Kenya came together as a partner prior to that. Um, Nike was not the sponsor of the Kenyan Federation or frankly, even many of the athletes. So I got to go to some of the homes of athletes, which was pretty wild and incredible and humbling to, to, to see, um, spend time at St. Patrick's High School with Brother Colm and got to just get the vibe of, you know, people recognize um, how talented the Kenyan runners are, but they don't always recognize the challenges that they also have um, in so many, so many different, so many different ways and the, the toughness of those runners, I think, surpasses the the talent. It's just a pretty pretty incredible um, experience. Yeah. And got to work on some cool spikes um, with the team. And we did the original Eldoret, named after the the key city. And then um, I worked at the beginning of the shoe that became the Jasari. Um, and uh, yeah, so a lot of fun, incredibly inspiring place. If you care about running, it's it's the uh, it's really the 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 most important place in the world, I think, for running. Yeah. That, that was a really big time with the spikes where I, I feel like when we hit Eldoret, Jasari, those were relevant for so long. It really wasn't until recent with Dragonfly that those shoes couldn't compete with the modern shoes. Those, 
really good shoes for the time. Yeah, yeah. The um, it's, it, I think that's been the history of the spike industry. I think the spikes from the early '80s were still the best spikes until the mid '90s, and then um, and obviously all the changes, uh, the knowledge around foam and carbon fiber and different height setups have kind of changed the game to um, not just give an athlete great fit and great friction with the ground and lightweight, but now it's actually giving performance benefits and, and rebound and efficiencies that you know we weren't even thinking about back then. Yeah, especially when you have 100 college kids breaking four minutes when, <laughs> when indoor season. I mean, it's just ludicrous, right? Yeah, it's 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 incredible. Um, <laughs> and uh, how many high school kids broke four minutes last year? It was like six or eight, and it took how long for Alan Webb to join the group? Yeah, it's it, uh, thirty some odd years. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's been incredible to watch. There's no question that uh, the tracks, the the product, um, and the training, I think, has just um, you know has just changed <laughs> to a point where. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, just maybe a description of what your diet was like when you were competing <laughs> back in the well, 70s and 80s. Yeah, I would say in the late 80s, I was partially responsible for launching the Guinness brand in, um, <laughs> in America. That was, a, that was a, a, a post-workout um, necessity for a group that I was running with back in the day. So, yeah, I um, I didn't know anything about nutrition Um I worked a lot of jobs during that time, and so I, I didn't sleep. And so to this day, I think I trained myself back then to be able to train hard and not not sleep more than four hours or so. And uh, so it's different. I think now people have, you know, they're sleeping in chambers at altitude and maybe even wearing super shoes while they do it. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, the game has changed a lot, a lot. So. Yeah. You know, what's uh, fun was last night we were at uh, the Cal Poly track, and uh, I don't know how it came up, but we talked about Chris Shilley, one of your teammates, and it turns out he's a really good friend of mine. And it was funny because I said, yeah, Chris thought he was going to Caltech, but he applied to Cal Poly. <laughs> That's a great story. And he said, <laughs> what'd you say? He says, that sounds like Chris. Right? Sounds just like him, yeah. <laughs> and so we called up Chris, and uh, so they reconnected. And then afterwards, uh, Tom called uh, Mark Coogan. Wasn't he in Hawaii? Yeah, Mark's Mark's on the beach. He's just uh, on vacation or something. On vacation, he just uh, earned a couple of medals for the U.S. over in um, in Scotland a few weeks back, and so nice break. But Mark and I and Chris Shilley trained uh, trained a lot together back in the day, so it was fun to call Mark and let him know he was still alive. We didn't know where he was, so it was nice. Yeah, and then yeah. you had Kempinen on that team. He made the yeah. Well, he made the Olympic team in the marathon. Yeah, uh, famous for barfing during the race and <laughs> yeah <laughs> stuff like that. But it's really cool. I mean. Um, you know, you're mentioning that uh, Coogan uses the same training that you guys did, and he coaches uh, Ellie St. Pierre, and she probably had arguably the best performance of the meet. I mean, yeah. she second place was world record holder in the 5,000, and third place is a world record holder in the steeplechase. And she ran a hell, and she set a meet record, American record. She said it was insane, and she's doing the same training that you guys did, except she probably slept more, sleeps more than four hours a night. Drink some more milk than Guinness. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. probably didn't drink a whole lot of Guinness yeah. either. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, we were, uh, I was looking because obviously you, Shilly, were running really fast in the day. And I found a race result from uh, Plymouth <laughs> to Provincetown. Can you tell us, because oh, this, this is a pretty wild race. Can you tell us about that and what made that race so special? Well, first, I think the year that we ran that race as a club, I think it was the last year or second to last year they ran it because there was um, there were issues with traffic out. It was, I believe, it was in the fall, and I, um, and you ran um, a, each ran a long leg. So I was a mile or so. My leg was way too long. I might have been like <laughs> seven miles, and it felt like a, an ultra to me. And um, yeah, and, and we. Um, we ran in almost a hurricane. I don't think they would have run the race today. And uh, and we had a ringer on the anchor leg, a guy named Richard Naruka. So it was a it was a dog fight all the way to the last leg. And then Richard Naruka was a 27, 20 or something, 10K guy. And he just left left the field and we won by about five minutes or so. But yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was a long time ago. It's hard for me to remember how too does much that, about how it. How does that race work? So it is relay style, but relay can style, you take whatever sim- path you want? No, no. You, okay. you, it's, it's, it's a path. Um, the, the old school clubs in Boston were notorious for pointing people the wrong direction uh. on that, on that uh, <laughs> course. And I think that was even covered in an article where they, someone would run half a mile the wrong way before they uh, realized it and no one would tell them. Because <laughs> um, at the end of the race, you... Um, 
you won like a little cheap trophy. So I guess that was important enough to cheat. So <laughs> um, yeah, but a lot of fun. And, and the people I w was on that club with, I'm still friends with all of them. A guy named Tommy Ratcliffe, who's a sports agent today, um, actually worked in that Nike store with me as well. And uh, his son is Thomas Ratcliffe right. that um, ran at Stanford and a great, great kid, great runner. Yeah. Um, yeah, so still connected with all those people from the from the 80s. Right. And your, your sons ran or are still running, right? Yeah, all three of my boys um, were good, solid high school runners. And then the older two ran at Providence College. Um, and um, the youngest is a sophomore running Division Three at Brandeis um, outside of Boston and having a ball with it. And uh, all both... Uh, all three boys, sort of 800, 1500, and um, hate hate distance as much as their dad did. So, um, <laughs> but uh, your, your your youngest ran one fifty last year, didn't he? Yeah, he ran one fifty point two last year as a freshman. So nice nice way to start yeah start his career. And he's he's new, relatively new to the sport. Um, um, yeah, it was like a lot of kids. You know, COVID kind of wiped out a, a few years. Um, so yeah, he's got he's having a ball. And, and similar to you, because you didn't start running till later in your high school career. Yeah, I had like dabbled in it a little bit, um, but it wasn't until my junior year. Yeah. And um, I happened to be a woman uh, at Newton North High School that was, I believe, number one or number two in the United States at the time. And in the mile, I knew nothing about running. And my first few races were disasters. And I told my friends I was going to quit but not until I got faster than Liz Natale, who had run like a 450 mile or something at the time. And uh, so once I did that, I said, yeah, it's actually kind of fun. So without Liz Natale being so fast, I probably would have quit. Um, so I ended up faster than Liz, so I can check that off my <laughs> list. And she went on to have a great collegiate. She was fourth as a freshman NCAA cross. And uh, and I haven't, haven't had any communication with her since those days, but... Um, uh, I always tell people without her running so fast, I would have probably never stuck with it. So, And we talked about Athletics West, and we, we've talked about it a couple of times yeah. on the podcast now. Obviously, the premier club of the late 70s and 80s, Boston Track Club, maybe not quite as well known, but did you ever beat Athletics West in any competition? Yeah, well, I have to be clear. I was not on the, the A team from Nike Boston that beat Athletics West in cross country, but I was on a B team. But the A team are Coogan, Bob Kempinen, Frank Powers, um, yeah, a few on others. Yeah, Sapienza. Um, <laughs> they, uh, they beat the Athletics West team at US Championships at Van Cortland. And uh, for us, that was like a real fun, yeah. a real fun. Caught um, everyone off guard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and Athletics West wasn't around much longer after that. So, yeah. They packed yeah. it in. Yeah. <laughs> for undisclosed reasons. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, what's next, Joe? Well, let's talk to Danny here. All right, Danny. I was going to say, I couldn't be more different, you know? Yeah, okay. your background. <laughs> I was going to say we should probably start with some of Tom's biggest mistakes. I think in 2000 and 2011, he employed me at New Balance. Yeah. 2013, he brought me to the U.S. I think just piling up, stacking up the mistakes. <laughs> um, yeah, my background couldn't be more different, truthfully. I um, Growing up in South Africa, I was much more of a team sports guy. You know, I think my... Um, <clears throat> the only time I ever ran track was when they came and pulled me out of the cricket nets and forced <laughs> me forced me to do it. I was a 100 and 200 meter guy, which you probably wouldn't recognize today. And I ran kind of my later years in high school and actually did okay, even as, as much as I hated it. I, I, um, I did okay. And I, you know, we talk a lot today about this notion of like the athlete that then gets into running, you know, and I think I would never have considered myself a runner. runner w running was always about being better at my sport. And it was one of the things I disliked the most about being better at my sport. Mm -hmm. You know, I would rather have spent more time passing a ball or kicking a ball or running after a ball um, during that time than I would have done running. But I recognized that I, I didn't have the fitness that I would have had if I, if I wasn't doing as much running. I moved to London then in kind of early 2002. And, um, you know, I feel like I played rugby for a few more years in the UK and, and kind of decided that it hurt too much. Um, every kind of Saturday and not being able to work, walk again until like Wednesday and then doing that to yourself again. And I happened to have a group of friends that were thinking about running marathons at that time and thought it was a crazy idea. I don't know why I'd want to do that. But someone convinced me to put in a ballot for the New York City Marathon 
and I did and I got in which you know today is almost unheard of with the popularity of that race you right. know it's unless you know someone at New Balance it's very <laughs> hard it's very hard to get into the New York Marathon and it ended up being a like a strange story in a sense that I went there I didn't run because I was so hurt but I thought maybe I could and I went home back to the UK without ever having run it and um, I went back the following year and I and I ran it and I'm not going to say I loved it, but I enjoyed it enough to think maybe I'd want to do another one. And, you know, the one thing about the New York City Marathon is it just keeps pulling you back, right? There's it's not an another, awesome event. There's not another race like that in the world. I think I did my sixth one last year, and, you know, I feel like that's the only one I ever wanted to do again. And it's the only one I've done. And I think only one I've done really more than a few times of maybe London, but really New York more than anything else. And... Um, yeah, I, I then did a few ultra marathons. Even being a South African, you know, we we like to run. If you if you say to South Africa that you just ran a marathon, everyone's like, "Well, why did you stop?" Type yeah. thing, you yeah. know. So comrades and comrades, two oceans yeah. and those things are so, um, yeah, so big from where I come from. So I don't know. I think I'm like 35 to 40 of those races um, at holy. this point. So I think it's time to stop. I was saying to Tom, I think half marathons might be the distance going forward. They don't hurt hurt yeah. quite as much. How'd you get into it? running industry like you're in a pretty technical area that of the yeah, yeah. I, again like s totally different to tom i think you know i I'm, my my graduate degree at university was looking at low limb biomechanics and i thought i was going to work in the orthotics industry truthfully and mm -hmm. um, when i moved to the uk we started a, a retail store that was focused on selling inserts firstly for people who were buying ski boots and then in the summer we were like well we've still got to pay our rent what are we going to do and you know there were there's probably more injured runners than there are skiers but skiers really struggle for comfort whereas runners really struggle for industries i mean sorry from an injury perspective um yeah so we started doing that and um, i worked in that business for four or five years before jumping across to the brand side um you know and i i did some work with adidas and mizuno and then Ultimately, my first American brand that I worked for was a brand probably your listeners won't have heard of, but you two may have, called Somnio. And you oh, came yeah. here with Jamie Lachance, right? I, um, I came here with Jamie Lachance <laughs> from Brooks, yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so that was, that was kind what of What was an, the story behind that shoe? Yeah, it was... It, it was, um, was it have some sort of inserts or yeah, it was where you can adjust the, the cushioning level? Yeah, yeah, it was a, it was a bunch of guys that came from... Um, specialized bikes and they um in the bike industry at that time they were working really hard on aligning joint alignment through the hip and then through the legs so they were putting varus wedges and different height insoles into their cycling shoes and when you bought a special specialized shoe at that point it came with this kit and you were then going to go to a specialized fitter and they were going to align you up in a camera system and um and create the best possible posture for you on the bike and the guys who developed that with Specialized decided that they wanted to try and put that into running footwear. So right. the idea at that point was to be able to change different cushioning properties in the midsole. So there were pieces that you could put into the midsole at like 10 different hardness increments. So 45, 55 and 65. And then there was three different la layers of varus wedges that you could put on the top of the midsole as well as three different um, inserts to go inside it. <laughs> I'm doing the math in my head right now. I know, yeah. I know you're laughing. I know you're laughing. But the funniest part of that is that <laughs> it all came in this like massive toy box. And I mean, y you know, the notion of uh, getting a kid on a floor to just put the shoes back in the right place, <laughs> let alone try and find the insert and the wedge and the cushioning piece. Yeah, it didn't um, didn't work out that well. <laughs> yeah, Danny Did took me through this during the job interview, and we still <laughs> hired him, which is uh, which is shocking. <laughs> but uh, I, okay, yeah. so that really leads into my next question because we're seeing all this innovation right now, and when we look over the years, there's been a couple like chapters of big moves in the running space. Um, we've talked recently about Jean Luc with Hoka and some how he brought a lot of his knowledge from the ski space to running to really revolutionize the. Uh, yeah, the, change it from total minimal to yeah. maximal. What do you guys do when you're hiring designers, product people? What do you look for to get that kind of spark that is looking at the industry from a different perspective? Yeah, I mean, so much we take, you know, Danny will agree with me on this. We take so much credit for amazing product. And the reality is those those industrial designers, those young young kids out of school, 
generally they wouldn't be in that space if they weren't just uber curious people. And when you surround that kind of curiosity and talent with the right resources, um, you're going to get some magic that comes out of them. And so a lot of these things that I can cite from working at different brands, that's really you know, where, where it comes from is just the ability to make sure you're properly resourcing like high energy creativity. Um, so yeah, of course, some of it comes from, from us um, thinking about the line planning and the briefing and where there's opportunities within the marketplace. Um, and I do think for brands that are established, it's even more difficult at times because um, um, the, the, the retail trade, the consumer has expectations of what you should do or shouldn't be doing or what your expectations are. Whereas um, startup brands or someone that comes into it new has nothing but but license in front of them to try you know new and different things. So I think in terms of the hiring piece, though, it's it's to me in general, it's making sure people are passionate about what it is that we're we're trying to do. And I feel like we've done a nice job with that. Um, I joined in the end of '08, um, and just been so fun to see the team build. Um, I know you guys had Keith Kelly, Hi. you know, on the on the podcast, who's like a my fourth son, I tell people. Um, but yeah, Keith and I and all of us have become really close. He brought a connectivity to the sport, a connectivity to the retail channel that I think is best in class you know, in our industry. Um, John Evans, who silently has done so much for this brand, um, he and I work very closely together on building the relationships with the first athletes that we brought on, when I joined in 08, really our most sort of marquee known runner was Dick Beardsley, who hadn't run in 20 years or so, and we were using him as sort of a voice of the brand. Fantastic story, fantastic guy. But in the meantime, you know, high school running, collegiate running was sort of peaking, and the the, the, the those athletes were not identifying, um, you know, with, um, with Dick Beardsley. So um, bringing in female runners, um, helped us get younger, helped us get more appealing to women, um, and and frankly, just helped us get faster as a brand. Because when you bring in an athlete, it's not just um, to promote your brand through through product, but it's also to like them be the squeaky wheel to make great stuff, um, how it functions. And um, so when you give that to a young designer and say, you know, we just signed Emma Coburn, and um, She's always had problems with her spikes in the past. You know, what, what, there's a problem to solve there that can lead to some really great things. What training shoes she needs, what she wants to feel like in her apparel. Um, and then you start to multiply that now by the dozens of athletes we have. Um, they just keep us energized internally. And I think that's where our version of sort of innovation and speed and everything comes from. Wasn't Jenny Simpson behind the original version of this? Right um, Jenny was the first sort of marquee um, athlete that came on and, and, she was a real difference maker for us. So the original 890, um, we had Andy Badley in the UK and we had Jenny here in the US and we um, used them as sort of the icons of those models. So um, we, we even called out their names on the original product, the Badley and the, and the Barringer. Barringer yeah. and, um, and for us at the time, it was, a, it was a big breakthrough to have a shoe that light um, and that dynamic. At the time, New Balance was sort of known for tried and true shoes for kind of that middle of the pack runner, um, particularly men, and then to come in with a shoe that we did in lots of colors, really lightweight. It drew attention to our brand in a way, from our running brand in a way that it hadn't um, probably in many, many years. And it was successful for us around the world. So it really helped us globalize our footprint within running as well. And when we look at the athletes you guys have signed recently, you look at McLaughlin, Coburn, you guys have strategically picked just superstars how hard is it to you know with limited budget find that perfect athlete that represents I think the an, an example is like like how do you find ellie right oh so, god yeah right i mean no no she was on anybody's radar no yeah we all take credit for who actually <laughs> discovered ellie but uh you know if you're from new england i mean um ellie um you know she was just an absolute you just watch her run once she was at university of new hampshire um, you watch her run once and you can see there's something really special there. And I just don't think other brands or other teams saw what we saw in Ellie. Heather McLean, who ran at UMass Amherst, was another one. I was lucky enough to have seen her run a lot in high school. She's just an incredible kid, um, could always just hang tough and then kick with anybody. And so, you know, she's been under four minutes. Um, Emily McKay right now, who's been under four minutes and just meddled and probably one of the more one of the goosebump moments in Scotland was her making that move in the in the um, in the mile. I mean, I'm sorry, in the um, in the um, yeah, in the mile. Um, her making that move was just incredible. 
And, um, but no, we, these were athletes that we saw and we thought their story would fit really well with us. Their upside was, was incredible. Um, and then there's a whole nother, you know, a whole group of athletes that we have that kind of, um, um, fit the bill and they work for kind of what we're trying to do. So we are intentionally very selective. Um, and it's not just for budgetary reasons. It's also just that way you can take better care of them. You can utilize them more, um, in traditional marketing and digital marketing, or even, even just in grassroots, um, piece of it. So we got Corey McGee, who, why I'm here in California, Corey, uh, Corey's getting married on Saturday, uh, in Santa Barbara. So, um, it'll she be fun to see She picked a good week. That. It's the weather's beautiful right now. Yeah, I've, yeah. I, it's um, I, I I don't believe the weather's never not beautiful here. I don't believe any of that. <laughs> but uh, every once in a while, yeah, yeah. But uh, but she's also been under under four minutes in the fifteen hundred. So it's a really fun, really fun group of people to um, to be able to work around. And how's how's it doing the NILs? Because you, didn't you sign oh, yeah. Graham, the, um, the kid from Harvard? We did. Yeah, Graham Blanks joined us in January as an NIL athlete while he finishes up at Harvard. And um, yeah, just you know. Um, He's not from Boston, but he's been in Cambridge and- um, Well, I mean, he checks every, the, checks fits every the freaking prof- box. Fits the profile for us. Super. Yeah. I've got to meet him a few times now. Just super nice, super humble. Um, and um, we look at him as someone that we want to have you know, a long-term relationship with and his, his upside is just uh, immense. And then um, you have high school kids like the Quincy Wilson. Yeah, you know, we're very competitive um, with our- um, indoor and outdoor high school nationals. We think for us, it's one of the more important few days of the year. We know many of these athletes are going to go on and run at a college that you know, likely not to have been a, a New Balance um, sort of sponsored college, but we want to build connectivity with that with that community. So we have a you know more than a handful of high school NIL, and it's it's really to help us promote and then really help them showcase what they can do at high school nationals and other major meets. So. Um, yeah, that 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 um, four hundred was another another. <laughs> just I was I was there for that, and it was just an unbelievable. His his um, semifinal over at Reggie Lewis, you could see what he was going to do the next day, as he was shutting down in like low forty sixes. So yeah, for those that don't know, he ran forty five seventy six for a national record. And to put that in perspective, at the World Championships in the four by four hundred, Noah Lyles ran forty five six eight with the running start. So he ran essentially as fast as Noah Lyles, and this kid's 16 years old. Yeah. Yeah. It's unreal. Yeah. <laughs> Just crazy, crazy talented. But um, yeah, so it's been fun. And, and um, you know, for us, what we're most proud of is the buzz and the excitement around those meets, but also that, you know, they're in the product. And um, um, and that says a lot for what Danny and the team have done to the product needs to work for these type of athletes. And the SDX and the MDX have, um, f- for the, few amount of athletes we have in it relative to competitors, the performance of those, what has happened on in those spikes has been absolutely mind boggling. So. Yeah. so with that being said, I feel like I'm every every few months giving you a text, what's McLaughlin wearing? What's Sisson wearing? What's what's the, how closely are you working with these athletes to get them in the spike that's right to their needs come the most important race day of their life? Yeah, I think, I think there's probably more customization than the general consumer realizes, right? I think it's whether it's the way that the shoe fits, it's the materials that go into the midsole, it's different layups of carbon fiber to perfect stiffnesses for them. So there's a lot of there's a lot that goes into into that. And I think we kind of treat it as in two buckets in some ways, in that we have not not necessary caliber of athletes, but just ones that are harder to solve for. So we probably run 15 to 20 athletes directly through our innovation team, which would include Sydney and some of those people that you mentioned, just because their needs are a little bit more um, extreme perhaps than than some of our other athletes. And then we run everybody else through our inline teams, making sure that we're adjusting fits and shapes and all of those things for them as well. But it it is it is a case of how big is the solve that we're looking for? Is it a problem that they have with their footwear or is it a performance benefit that we're trying to get after for them? And it kind of defines where they go. But I think overall, the comment would be in general, more customization than I think people okay. would often think. So, I mean, obviously, yeah, some tweaks here and there, as you mentioned, but the question that I feel like I'm always asked, what is in essence McLaughlin wearing when she's setting her records? Yeah, so we we launched the Sydney Signature Spike in the last um, in the last few days. So that's an easy one to answer. She'll be wearing 
the MDX V3 going forward, okay. um, which is the inline spike with right. some customizations for Sydney. But you know, the, from the very beginning, since she joined our brand, she just had a love for the MD500 upper, you mm -hmm. know, and that was that was fit related, that was comfort related, that was performance related, and ultimately, I think for her, also just general confidence related. And Tom will attest to this: the number of conversations and the amount of times we tried to get her to move away from that. It's kind of back to his story, his story at the beginning, where he was customizing some of his own shoes and keeping older versions that he preferred. And I think Sydney, um, Sydney felt the very same way about that upper. And what we were really changing for her was the bottom units, right? right? Really dialing in those elements to get her where she needed to be without kind of messing with the fit. Often it's good to have something that's consistent that you know is going to work for them yep. while you're looking at other areas to think about perfecting. Um, but we've we've transitioned, you know, timely kind of for us in 2024, where she'll be in in the the final, um, you know, inline shoe in her own color. Hopefully, doing special things this summer. Yeah, it's interesting you bring up about the upper and you know trying to get her away from it, but she kept coming back because I've talked with a couple other pro athletes. And they're in the lab testing different shoes and they're finding maybe one or two shoes is giving just a little bit better efficiency, but they say, I like the feel of this shoe better. Sure. And they're going with the shoe that they like the feel. So sometimes the numbers in the lab don't tell the full story. Oh, for sure. And I think ultimately you've just got to feel the best that you can when you get out there and, and you're ready to start your event. Yes, in certain instances, there's glaring differences in terms of your overall performance, but you know, so much of it is is really where you feel the most comfortable and the most confident. And it's just been interesting to see the athletes change too. You know, I think, you know, not even back to the era that we were talking about with Tom, but I, I feel like as as athletes now coming out of college and some of those NIL conversations, they're so much more tapped into what are the performance opportunities, what are the training performance opportunities and recovery, what does race day look like? And there's just so much more going on in terms of getting these guys into the right footwear and fine tuning it um, versus where maybe we were even five to 10 years ago where it was about running 100 miles a week and putting on a, a spike that gave you enough traction and kind of that was the package, you know? Yeah, it was uh, like uh, talking with Angles, Craig Angles. You know, his coach told him, you need to get in super spikes. <laughs> You're being a dumbass. Right? He's like, why? He no, he, he said, yeah, why? Right? But he said, do it. Just do it. Yeah. Right? And they work. You know, don't yeah. question it. Now find the ones that, that you like. Sure. Yeah. And yeah. now we have options these days. I mean, well, a few years yeah. ago, you were kind of limited. Yeah, but now, you know, all the brands have really good product across the board. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, no, I mean, you know, yeah. just just uh, so the, the uh, listeners in Listen Land no, can you describe what your goals are with fuel cell versus fresh foam? Because I'm reading stuff on running shoe geeks, and they have no clue what's going on with like. <laughs> well, yeah. and, and we've even explained over times that within fresh foam and within fuel cell, it just because it's a fuel cell foam doesn't mean it's going to be the same fuel cell. You know, there's right. different durometers, feels, tweaks. Yeah, and I think it's interesting when you when you make that comment, right? I feel like where we were a few years ago when there was stability versions of fuel cell shoes and some of those things, the variety in terms of overall feels under the foot was much greater than it is today. You know, we've tightened the range up, we've got really focused, and we've really tried to focus in on performance and energy return within that silo. And I think what that's led to is a lot of similar materials, right? Whether they be 100% P-backs in the SC Elite or whether they be P-backs infused like the Rebel, we've definitely got to a point where our menu of the feels and the experiences that runners would have is a little bit more similar. And then thinking about how and where to plug and play those things, I think is is what really makes the shoe special and makes the consumer experience what we want it to be today. But Joe, to answer your question, right, we do have these two key platforms mm -hmm. for us within running today. Fuel Cell, I think, you know, we just spoken to that around performance and energy return. And then, you know, I think when we think about about fresh foam, we are talking about so much more versatility. You know, we are 100% focused on cushioning first versus energy return and just this notion of comfort. But I think it's really important when we think of the breadth of consumer that is wearing the fresh foam product today, you know, number one kind of attribute for them is certainly being as comfortable as we can be. 
we're still, you know, creating those shoes 100% with a running mindset um, at the very forefront of all of it. But I, you know, we see as many walkers, as many people that are trying to solve for injuries or trying to solve for foot problems, gravitating towards those shoes. Um, and I think it's so much to do with just how comfortable they are, how versatile they are in a running environment works so so well in some of those other use cases as well yeah and that's uh i've been visiting running stores and that's the overriding uh consensus when you're talking to customers when they're going brick and mortar they want comfort yeah. and running shoes are yeah. the, the stereotype of running shoes it's going to be the most comfortable shoe that you can own i mean you know we're partners with tennis warehouse and there isn't a tennis player that goes to the court in a tennis shoe right they're walking up in running shoes and then they're sure. cha- changing out into tennis sure. shoes because tennis shoes frankly suck i mean they really do um but you need them for playing tennis playing tennis and running shoes yeah. I, I think you had it as one of your reps was doing that playing pickleball or yeah. something no <laughs> i think that was me actually. that was you yeah, that was me. <laughs> me propels the greatest pickleball shoe of all time oh. you heard it first yeah yeah Propel v5 I, I will say though the you know there's not like a wall that lies between you know in our case these two platforms and i think that's what people sometimes seek out the, the reality is it's a massive universe of runners and on one side you have athletes that perhaps two days or three days a week a 1080 or an 880 is their go-to shoe to keep them on the roads keep them healthy keep their foot in a relatively traditional like kind of setup Emma Coburn, right? you know, yeah and then on another day they're going to be in either a rebel or they're going to be an elite doing some up-tempo threshold work or they may be in their their mdx's on the track doing some fast stuff but then that other side is that is that consumer that owns the one pair of shoes for yep. you know four to four to eight months that they're in for their morning jogs or walks or runs. There's no reason that same shoe isn't the same shoe serving Emma Coburn on a, on a long long run. So um, the, the the setup is meant to be different, and the end result of that product is meant to be different. With one of them to get you from A to B as fast as you can get there, and the other one to get you you know through a year injury free yep. and. Um, and in, in the middle, there's, there's nice, healthy overlap. Yeah. I mean, I obviously these two bring the excitement. They bring the hype. They look great on video with the with the 360 spin around. But at the same time, shoes like the 1080, the more, that's where the majority of my miles are coming in, especially the more. I mean, I think you sent, I think I finally finished my fourth pair of more V4s that you sent me. Um, but I think in the same, you know, on the topic of fresh foam, Ballos. I think that's going to bring some excitement to the fresh foam space that maybe is the most exciting shoe I've seen. Yeah, I know it's interesting. I, I think um, we're also super excited for that one to come to the market. I um, Maybe it's a sign that we've all been doing this too long, that we <laughs> have that we are at kind of an inflection point in the 10th year of um, fresh foam in 2024. And it, it really forced us to look at the platform a little bit differently. I think when people think about innovation in our brand, they think fuel cell first. We don't think fuel cell first, but I think people do think that way. And, you know, this was a nice opportunity for us to really think about what innovation within fresh foam could look like and potentially set the platform on a new course um, as we think about what the next 10 years could potentially look like. And it's always fun to think about white space in running, right? We we very quickly go to what is our core for? What is our racing shoe? What a, what does the trail shoe need to look like? And we very quickly start putting things into boxes based on experiences and consumers. It's kind of fun to just stop sometimes, think about it a little bit differently, try and find a white space within this that you know runners can really um, benefit from. And I think to my comment around fresh foam and that level of versatility, the one thing we didn't try and do with Ballas is put a, a versatility filter over it. We really did want to think about what does running in fresh foam mean? What does running in a cushioned environment mean? And what is the best solution that we can provide? We're not thinking about jeans wear. We're not thinking about this and that and the next thing. We're just thinking about the best possible running experience. And I think that's why the shoot's going to be super cool. Yeah. yeah. I, I think you guys do a fantastic job of throwing stuff against the wall. And sometimes it sticks and sometimes it doesn't. Like, you know, I think the, what do you have, the Lorado on? Get the Lorado on. Right. And I think that's, I mean, that's Tom's shoe. <laughs> yeah. I think if it had a 990 upper on it, it would have blown up. <laughs> yeah. It yeah. just, it, it was, you I know, mean, for, it's a lot of shoe. It's, it's a lot of it's shoe. It's a bulky shoe, but it's a comfortable shoe to walk around in. So, you know, and that's the thing. You got to try things. And a year ago, I think it was like literally a year ago to date, 
we were in Boston and you handed off the first sample pairs of Ballos to me. And I quickly got 700 miles in them. But when you handed them <laughs> off to me. Oh, quickly. Well, <laughs> it took a couple months. But um, I remember when you handed them off, I was like, well, what is this? And you're like, just running it. And I said, is this supposed to be like a super blast comparison? Because I saw it like, does it have a super foam? You're like, no, it's its own thing. Just try it. So when I got it on, it, it's just, it's so different. And I think it looks good, but it, the runners aren't going to know until they get it on their feet and experience this softness, the smoothness. And I think the best way I can describe it is like, it makes easy running feel even easier. Yeah, I would, I would agree with all of that. And I think to your point, I, what I liked about what you said there is like, there isn't a box for it in some ways. You've got to get it on. You've got to try it to really understand what the uniqueness of it is. So we're excited about as many people as possible being able to do that, you know? So you guys are in the space. What's the next big thing that's coming? Uh, <laughs> what? Well, if they answer that, then all the other brands are going to... No, I mean, we're looking in the future. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, I have my ideas. Yeah, you know, and then I you... have mine. Carlio? Well, I, I will say whether it's the big thing or not, I do think we're already seeing um, kind of midsoles and setups starting to come back to normal heights. And we're starting to see some of the niche brands that we're very into the minimal piece, include, including New Balance, where we're playing around with a relaunch of Minimus um, late this year, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, July, August. July, yeah, August and, um, year, yeah. and our expectations are to make sure we're just doing some really cool stuff. Like we took that original concept and said, boy, with new materials, new foams, everything we've learned, uh, even about footwear manufacturing in that space has improved so much that we think we can take that original Minimus Insight and build something that is just just um, leap years ahead of where where it was. So I do definitely see more runners curious about getting back closer to the ground, strengthening lower extremities, strengthening quads, all these things that can get neutralized from a strengthening perspective through super shoes and massive midsoles. So we're starting to hear more and more, even outside the US, coaches trying to use minimalism as a training tool. Um, I'm starting to see more people out hiking in brands of you know zero drop type type shoes. So I do think that that natural, um, there was a lot we learned during that whole minimal uh, push back in the day, good and bad. There's a lot we learned. But um, what the, the good that we learned, I think, is that the body is meant to do certain things um, that um, totally kind of casting them in big midsoles take, takes away. So you're going to see some of that. I think there's going to continue to be a balancing out of um, when is the right time to use a super shoe from a training perspective versus not and um, and learnings will will come from that. Um, you know, I, I think it's been very slow in the US, but I, I do believe that everything that is happening with off-road ultras across the board, and, uh, independent of which group it is, um, I, I think you're gonna start to see even more growth of that off-road running piece and the product that comes with it. It's always been slow in the US um, versus, of course, Europe, but even, even um, South America and parts of Asia where, where trail shoes are a very big thing. And I think we're going to start to see some really interesting stuff come and demand for that type of product. Um, demand meaning more in innovation and I think more consumer acceptance. Are, are the Piba-based foams, are they, are they going to be the thing for a while? Is there new foam compounds coming? Is that always changing? What's, what's the next thing in the foam space? You know, I think I totally agree with Tom, in terms of like consumers and, and what we're starting to see there in relation to getting back towards, you know, lower to the ground and certainly what expansion into outdoor trail, you know, footwear starts to look like and the size of that market and the opportunity, we're, we're definitely seeing changes there. Um, you know, in terms of manufacturing, I, I know you're like frothing for it, I know. <laughs> um, but the truth is, is, is that I, I do think that in that area, the next jump is going to be another manufacturing jump and i think we're starting we're starting to see some of that now we aren't seeing any of those materials yet in the market um, um in in any kind of meaningful way so i do think there's going to be a large step forward there and i think the other thing about the pbacks one is is really interesting because you need to pair it with the right manufacturing techniques because otherwise the more you add we've seen performance go in the opposite direction so mm -hmm. i think it's a it's a good question. It's funny, like all of all of the runners today that really care about this product, they really do look at PBAX or PBA as the gold standard. And in many cases, they're right. 
but there's also opportunities just in a supercritical space without any kind of PIVA additive to really be also be getting better. So I feel like there are a few things coming. Um, I think we're super excited about you know one or two new things that hopefully we'll get into our brand before 2026. Um, yeah, but we'll see. Yeah, when uh, you say 2026, but that, that's the funny thing. I think a lot of people think you know, these things just, you're looking one year ahead, but you guys are oftentimes looking years and years into the future and these things take time to come to final form. Yeah, for sure. I think a lot of brands in our industry, with ourselves being one of them, you know, we, we do think about these four year cycles that are really the most important time in our sport, right? So as you think about what like that looks like, you know, we're, we're charting out to, you know, being in LA and in, in four years time right now, and what does our range look like to get us to that point? So that is really how we're thinking about it. And in many ways, working back from that point versus working f forward to that point. Well, that's how you do in coaching too, right? You start at the championship race and you plot out the schedule working backwards. Sure. And yeah. Are we going to see some pretty crazy stuff come Olympic time from a product perspective that people haven't seen yet? In 24 or 28? Uh, both, but 24 is coming up. You know, up. I, think, I think the thing about 24 is that so many of the athletes have been wearing development shoes yeah. of what they're finally going to be racing in at that point in time, probably for the last two years already, certainly okay. in our case for the last two years. So I think a lot of that is probably evolutionary and you've probably seen it on some Instagram account somewhere. So you kind of have a sense of what that's going to look like and in a final kind of cleaned up form um, is what we'll see in 2024. But then obviously taking the time and taking, you know, the additional insights and, you know, to Joe's point, this trajectory that we seem to be on in terms of performance in this space right now, you know, I think in some ways 2028 will be yeah, a total new frontier from where we are today. Right. And the rules keep changing with these spikes, with these shoes. So you also have to adapt as designers to, to adhere to the ever-changing rules. Hopefully, hopefully they'll be uh, a little more dialed in in the, in the coming years. Yeah, so yeah. we've got a rule change at the end of this year, right? And that's that's the last one that we know about, yeah. you know? So, and, and hopefully it'll be the last one for, for a little while, you know? And I think that's the reduction in height for the long distance track spikes coming down to 20 millimeters where everything will then be a max height of 20 millimeters. So I, yeah, I'm, I think we're all hopeful that that'll be a point, in, a point in time that we can then work forward from. Sure, there's no doubt just at the speed our industry's changing, there's going to be rule changes. But yeah, hopefully we're, we're a little further away from some of that right now. So we saw Vaporfly launch years ago around 40 mils. We've seen shoes like Prime X and even shoes like SC Trainer that are up in closer 45, 50 mils. When we talk about track spikes specifically, I know those are even lower, 25, 20 now. How much performance advantage could you theoretically get if there were no rules for track spikes, specifically for 100, 200 meter runners? You know, I don't have a great answer to that other than um, the, the longer the race, the more the advantages and the percentages come, okay. come into play. And I think we see that even with some of the performances that have been in relatively normal spikes over sprint distances the last few years. So I um, I think that, you know, no rules applied to a 10,000 meter spike. Mm -hmm. I think it could be, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it could be a 10% benefit. I think, you wow, know, that and much. I say that because it's a controlled distance on a controls. If you built your, your base off of the surface that they're mm -hmm. competing against and wor worked on those rebound scores off of Mondo mm -hmm. or whatever the surface may be, um, I think there could be immense benefits. Um, just, just um, you know, even the spikes themselves, if you look through archives from, you know, 100 years ago, we had these pins that stuck into the ground and, and you know, that really what you need is to that to stay on top of the track and that friction coefficient that's needed. So I think if if there were no no bars on a on like a ten thousand meter spike, I think it could be um, immense. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And what, when I'm looking at stuff, I I can see racing shoes under hundred grams in a few years. And, and I, th I, think, I think I think Joe, that is a piece of the future is that we really haven't brought weight, weight down, down in racing shoes, and we know that there has been proven 
sort of oxygen-based benefits, having less less weight right. I on think the I foot. Read, so. um, four ounces off of a shoe is worth three minutes in a sub 210 marathon. So it's pretty significant. Well, and on the topic of that much gains, I'm, I'm just throwing this out here. We saw with the swimsuits years ago how much uh, records just went down like that. Maybe, maybe you've got this stable of NIL high school athletes. Maybe we make this shoe and we shatter every high school record. Just throwing it out there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think we can do that within the rules. I think we're okay. already doing okay. that right now, shattering <laughs> most of the records. So, um, yeah, But yeah, no, true. it is... It is um, I think we all think that way, and I always use the um, the aluminum bat versus the uh, wooden bat analogy. I think it would be, you know, interesting to see, you know, what you could do in mm -hmm. um, environments where mm -hmm. um, it was a little bit less stringent of what you could do. I forget yeah. who was mentioning that. It was in golf because golf is going with a smaller ball. Yeah, and they're talking playing. about it, right? I don't think they've decided yet. I think they? they decided that. They? But what somebody was saying, well, they don't allow aluminum bats in Major League Baseball. So just have the smaller golf ball for the pros and let everyone else hit whatever the hell they want. Because gotcha. like, they're not going to take my golf balls away from me. They're not going to make the game harder <laughs> for me and you, Jeff. <laughs> There's no way. It's too hard already. It's, it's already hard yeah. enough. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, so we're talking about these shoes. I think now we move over to Kevin's shoe closet. And this week, we've got a fun one. Yeah. Can, can you tell us about this shoe? Not really. Maybe this Carlio. Is... <laughs> Maybe we ah. pass it on to Carlio, the historian. <laughs> Yeah, I was running in 1888. So uh, <laughs> no, this is a this is an original um, made in Boston 320, I believe, which was um, after 1972. So this is um, when the Davis family had purchased the company, and they were still building shoes in uh, Brighton, Massachusetts, adjacent to where our offices are today, and um, they were still doing customized shoes, which you know. <laughs> Um, you you may all know, but the, you know the history of New Balance was building inserts for people that were on their feet all day, and customizing shoes for athletes of all different sports, including including running. So um, this is around the time that New Balance got into mass manufacturing, and this particular shoe with the unique top down fangs that you see here and the big wrap in the back actually is the design inspiration for one of our biggest lifestyle shoes right now, um, the three two seven, which is a an incredibly successful lifestyle shoe for us in every every country in the world right now. Yeah. So it's kind of cool to have the original, incredibly dirty one in my hand here, Joe. <laughs> thank you. But um, but uh, yeah, th this this is not not only you know iconic in our history, but it's actually really helped us um, just with some visuals. Yeah, yeah yep. and we we remade that shoe too in the last kind of five to ten years. I have a pair of of one of our remakes. It's very very close material and kind of shape wise too what that original one was. Yeah. Now, Mr. Davis, the owner of New Balance and um, uh, co-owner with his wife, Anne, told me a story about this shoe at one point where there used to be a, I think it was monthly, Joe, maybe you remembered an actual televised recap of road racing called uh, Running and Racing yeah. on ESPN. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> yep. And us geeks all couldn't wait for Saturday afternoon to watch the highlights of road races from around the, the country. And Jim noticed that almost all of the footage during the race was from front on and you can't see the side logo, mm -hmm. and all the brands looked exactly the same from the front. So Jim asked the designer to come up with something that would be iconic so you could tell it was a New Balance shoe. So they put these fangs in here that gave a little bit, you know, a little bit of a, of a strong visual and also locked the, the, the um, sort of toes and forefoot down when running. So it was the only brand that had a differentiated look from the, the uh, camera angle front on. So... Kind of a cool little, Tidbit. little side story, huh? yeah, a little Easter egg there. That huh? is yeah. cool. That yeah. is cool. <laughs> and I, I also want to note that we've had a lot of shoes from Kevin's closet, a lot of Nikes. Most of those are crumbling apart, and this one actually is, is in pretty, pretty good, good shape, shape for for its age. So yes. the craftsmanship. Well, the, the the fans out in in listener land are going to be excited because uh, Kevin's wife. Noreen gave me a bunch of shoes. So we'll have Noreen's closet next. <laughs> we pretty much run through Kevin's closet. Yeah. I thought is. you were going to say she's pleased that you're getting all of these old shoes out of her house. Uh, no, she collects them too. So, yeah. <laughs> And we found a few of them are pretty expensive shoes, collector's items now. Oh, yeah. So yeah, I we hit Kevin, the jackpot. I called Kevin and told him that one, <laughs> one of the shoes that he gave me was going for $5,000. Something like that. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Just crazy stuff. Wow. But anyways, yeah. I think that... That should do it for the day, right? We we hit it all. Yeah. I mean, 
Thank you, Carlio. Oh, thank, thank you, you Danny. Guys. Thank, yeah, thank you, guys. This Thanks might have to become us. a regular uh, occurrence. Get you guys back on and keep giving it, us well, the inside give, scoop. Get them back every year, and we yeah. can we can discuss the uh, whatever the yeah. the advancements yep. that we've had the last year. Yeah, let's but, do it. Uh, yeah, for anyways, sure. Thank you, guys. Yeah, really thank appreciate you guys. it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. All right. Till next time. Like subscribe. Oh yeah, we gotta do that. Give, give the questions below. Yeah, if you got yeah, some, yeah, yeah. Give like, Carlio like, something extra crazy for us to answer. Yeah, and uh, like, and whoever's on listener land that said <laughs> uh, Newberry Park wasn't in super shoes uh, before last year, uh, you're wrong. You are absolutely <laughs> wrong. Just call me up and we'll have a, a discussion about this. I saw those kids wearing super shoes. Years ago. 2021 so, CIF finals, video evidence. It's video evidence. Do not right. doubt Joe Rubio. <laughs> this guy hey. doesn't mess up. I often. do mess up a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but, anyways, right. thanks everyone. All right, peace out. Peace out.